myself. So welcome to Leveraging Learning Best Practices uh, to Increase Engagement and Improve Outcomes. So I just thought I'd start off by uh, just the agenda for today, just a big picture. I'm a guy that likes to have uh, uh, show a little bit of a roadmap, and this is about as simple as I'm going to get for you. So I'm going to do a quick little welcome, uh, uh, a little introduction of myself and who, who uh, Tom Carl is in R1. And then I'm really going to dive into this whole idea of uh, a best practice model for learning and development. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll share uh, that. And then we're going to really explore certain elements of that. It's a, it's a process called ADDIE. It's out of the, uh, the training and development world, which I'll share a little bit about that. And so we're going to kind of dive into a couple of those elements so that really you can kind of look at and kind of look at your own program, your own curriculum, what you have going on in your, your center and see, you know, see what you're doing, what you're applying, what you're not applying. And really, you know, the, the goal for me is that hopefully we'll, we'll share enough, give you a little bit of a framework here around some of the, some of the practices and, 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 and learning theory so that you can take it back and, and start to explore how could you, you know, uh, explore making a shift, uh, seeing what kind of, of enhancements, changes, if it makes sense, or just really maybe go back. And my, one of my goals is I hope that you'll go back to some of your other leaders in your organization and, and, and push on, push on them to, to figure out how you can raise your program, kind of the bar in this area called learning to the, to the next level. So that's, that's one of my hopes today. So, so R1, so my, my name's Tom Carl and I'm the founder and president of, of R1. And what, I, uh, R1's new and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new organization that I've formed uh, with, with a couple of folks to really look at learning and how to bring it into this industry. The, my, my story is very, I guess, how do I, uh, uh, best to uh, explain that. I think, I think uh, uh, what I want to say about this just briefly is I come out of 25 plus years in learning and development in corporate America, working with mostly Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, government institutions, educational institutions on, on really how do, you, how do you really build good, good courses, good training, good curriculum. Uh, we also dove into some things around employee engagement. Uh, which really uh, translate very well to the whole setting of patient engagement. And so that's a, that's a background that I have that I, I come and I bring into this conversation today. I also have a recovery story myself. And not to go into too much detail on that, but what it's done for me is it's thrown me into this setting for a couple of years um, of which I had my own experience in it from a, really from a patient and client perspective. And then in the formation of R1, what I've been doing is I've really spent the last almost, wow, 14 months going out to programs around the country and exploring what are they doing around curriculum? What are they doing around the psychoeducation part of their programs? And, 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 and what I have found in a nutshell, I kind, of, kind, of, kind of springboard that over to why listen today is is what I, I think I found in, in, that, in that initial dive into the industry is, is that there is a, what I believe is an opportunity actually to, to uh, increase and enhance uh, this whole area. Um, I'll keep it simple. Um, one of the things I, I've seen from my own experience is just questions. I, 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 uh, if, if you could see my, my office here and the office here at the R1 headquarters with several of my colleagues, you'd see that there's all sorts of curriculum that we found in, in, in many, many, many treatment programs. And what we've seen in it is that it's very unorganized. I'll be perfectly frank. It's unorganized. It's inconsistent, uh, not well structured, um, not a lot of consistency and look and feel. Uh, when we go in and we ask questions like, what is the learning map for you know, all the curriculum that you offer? Can you break it down by the type of programs that you have? Um, what are the key learning objectives for each of the modules? Uh, can you show us some of that curriculum? What do people take home with that? Um, do you quiz people? And how do you do that? And, and what kind of results do you get when you try to measure the results of that psychoeducation part of your program? 
And so that's just kind of the backdrop that we have coming into this webinar today. And I thought what we thought we'd do is, is really use this, this webinar today, really kind of start the conversation with you and kind of share with you, again, a methodology, some, some thoughts around it, and just get you thinking about it. So why listen today, you see it on the screen, you know, hopefully it'll be a way to, you know, how can you differentiate your program from your competitors? You know, it's a competitive industry. What we're seeing is it's very competitive and it's consolidating. Many programs are coming together, which I think also adds another um, level of, of complexity or is how do you then have consistency of your programs and your psychoeducation across multiple locations? And you may already have multiple locations now, but let's say you bring on one or two more treatment centers. You know, how, how does that um, how do you build in that consistency as you bring on new, 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 new facets of the organization? Um, how does it fit into the equation of measuring your outcomes? You know, how can you even measure outcomes if there's no way of measuring the learning of the people that are experiencing the psychoeducation part of the curriculum? And so you see that. And then, you know, uh, one of the things I know that I've seen also is everybody's trying to differentiate themselves, bring, build their brand. And a question I'd have just generally at this point is, you know, how are you doing that? You know, when people go home, what I've found in, in even the take home materials is a lot of people throw them away. Uh, don't keep them. What I've seen is very uh, uh, workbooks that don't look like they hang together. Information that it's hard to go back to. Um, is there a folder? Are the worksheets all in a different format? And uh, it's, 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 it's all over the map. And I think that that's, a, that's an opportunity for many of you that are, that are here on the call today. And then I think this is an, also an interesting question, which is who's in charge of your learning at your organization? You know, who is it? Um, I know that most of the organizations that we've talked to thus far, you know, aren't large enough to have a whole person in charge of training and development you know, or curriculum development. So what happens then is who's in charge of that? Is it the clinical director? Does the clinical director, you know, uh, really lead that um, curriculum development piece? Or do they assign it to, you know, one of the counselors on their team? What's the background of that person in terms of putting together curriculum, understanding, you know, learning theory and how to look at learning styles and and so how does that all happen? And so that's a, I think that's a question for each of you on the call here is who does it for you? And do they have the background and the resources to do that well? So these are all things that I'm hoping that you'll have in the background today as you're, as you're here on the call with me. Objectives for today, again, keep them simple. We're gonna to try to learn a, a methodology for how to even look at curriculum development, uh, that psychoeducation part of your, your program. You know, how do you even, as you, as you dive in and saying, okay, here are some of the topics that we want to address in that, whether it be, you know, how we want to educate people on stages of change or some relapse prevention or the, uh, some, some neuro uh, uh, development theories. So how do we do that? And so what are the learning objectives for each of those modules? How do you even assess those? You know, what are the success measures that you want to measure in your program? So we're going we're gonna to give you seven types of those to walk away with today. And then we're going to help you kind of relook at, you know, what are the learning styles that people have in, you know, everybody that's coming into these programs. I mean, I understand that they're patients and they're in treatment. Some of them are, are, are early in treatment um, or early in the process. But at the end of the day, you know, we're coming at this that they're learners, you know, and there's a new subject matter. You know, it's called their recovery. It's called you know, this addiction process, it's called this substance use disorder. And, and in that, <clears throat> there is a, there's a language, there's a vocabulary, there's a tax, taxonomy. And, and how do you teach them that those new, those new words and those new, those new elements that they're going to have to do in this new subject matter? And then how do you get to them? What's their learning style? And is your psychoeducation meeting the needs of your learners? So... We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the first things I wanted to do is just kind of make a distinction here. Um, and I think I, I, I kind of led with it in my introduction. I'm not a clinician and I don't have that background. I, I come out of learning and development. So I'm coming at it, the, the, the conversation from that lens, uh, good or bad. That's where I'm coming from. 
But, you know, the, the distinction I want to make today is, is, you know, you all have process groups and you have psychoeducation groups. And what we want to talk about today really is that psychoeducation group. And, and in that, one of, one of the things we wanted to, to just make sure that we make that distinction because that is the area that we want to really kind of focus on here today. You know, one of the things I've, I've noticed as I've gone into many, many treatment centers this last 14 uh, year, this 14 months, year and a half is one of the things, and it's just, it's just where I come from in my own experience is I, I'm used to walking into learning settings where one of the first thing you do, if it's a classroom environment, and, and we'll, one of the things that we did in, in my old uh, world was, you know, we looked at distance learning. We looked at how do you do blended learning? How do you, when do you bring, what's the sequence of learning? When do you bring people into a classroom environment? How many instructors are there? What's the expertise of the structures? There's so many things that go in in that equation. But one of the things I just intuitively do when I go into a learning environment is I look at what's the structure of that setting. And one of the things that I've noticed, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is, is I've noticed that there are so many rooms that all of the rooms are set up as process groups. They all have chairs in a circle, you know, that's set up for that type of, of, of group. And what I rarely see, and this may be not the case for your organization, but what I see is I don't see a lot of rooms that have that are set up for, you know, active action learning that are set up for an educational setting where, you know, there's tables. There is, you know, a place for the facilitator. There are tables for students. Uh, they're set up so that there can be group work, you know, small group work, larger group work. And so that's a question I'd have for you just um, as we'll get there, but, but part of the thing I want to do here was just make that distinction of we're really going to talk about today about the psychoeducation part of that of that setting. Makes sense. So hopefully you all are are with me. Are you with me? I hope you're with me. Okay. So on the psychoeducation piece, you know, it's just some of the general questions we want to throw out to you today, and we'll dive into some of these. Is you know, do you as you look at your program? And when you have patients and clients coming into it, and you have a lot of things that you're going to do with those folks, whether they're for a detox program or whether they're for an outpatient program, an intensive outpatient IOP, whether they're for a residential program, a 21-day, a 28-day, or an extended care, what do you do in aftercare? You know, one of the things that we, 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 we want to explore is, is, do you have a curriculum map for that? You know, what does that look like? Do you have that detail to the level of, you know, what are all those modules that we, we, we find in our program on how we're going to differentiate our program? What are those? And then across the top, to kind of think of it like a table, you know, across the top of the type of programs that we have, we have an adolescent program, we've got a, a men's group, a women's group, whatever, however you've laid out yours, or it's all, you know, homogeneous. Um, you know, whether however you've laid it out, do you have that, um, do you have a map of that curriculum? Do you have it by location? Uh, and then within that, you know, what are the, the, the subject areas that you're addressing? Do each of them have learning objectives spelled out? You know, is, is your, you know, you can see the questions here. Is the curriculum consistence over, over those locations? You know, do you have standardized materials? Are the are the workbooks that we're using over in Virginia, if you have multiple locations, is it the same as you use in Pennsylvania? Or is your IOP have a common look and feel with your residential program? What are the synergies? What are the overlaps? What are the core programs? And so those are some of the things that we want to talk about this. How's your room set up? How uh, do you have in your physical locations? Do you have them set up in a way? Do you have the right equipment? Do you have tables? Do you have monitors? Do you have laptops? You know, do you have all that? Do you have ways to have flip charts? You know, what do you, how does that look? And then again, around the psychoeducation piece, it's around measurement. We're gonna talk about those seven ways to measure, but you know, do you measure? Um, I'll be honest with all, most of the places that I visited more recently, 
And even in my own experience, I, I, I've rarely seen quizzes. I've re rarely seen tests. I've rarely seen a place where the, the center of the program is testing and measuring, did people learn what we were trying to teach them? And it could be basic learning. We'll talk about the seven types of measurements, but are we doing any of that? Do you do that? How do you do that? Who does that? And so those are all questions that we want to raise for you today. All right, here's the quiz for you on the call. Who knows what the term ADDI stands for? You take a second, maybe some of you have some background in learning development or have, have done your own, you know, as you've gone to do your own curriculum development, you said, hey, let me go look at what are the best practices in, in that. And so it's, it's very simple. It's out of a, comes out of a, you know, another industry, right? What do you do when, you, when you're in your own industry and you want to, to bring in some best practices? You go out and find out who or what's the leading practice in, in, that, in that subject matter. And if we were to go to the, the, the American Association of Training and Development, ATD headquartered in, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, you'd find that they have a whole set of, of, of subject matter expertise and how you do how you do that. And there are, you know, bookstores about how do you develop curriculum. And so that's, uh, it's very simple here. You can see it's a, it's a six step process, analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And it's a continuous process. So it is a process model. We didn't design it here on the screen as a, as a continuous process, but it's, it's one of those things that is ongoing. You're always doing it. It's, you know, we're going to continue to do this. Do we, do we look at this every year? Do we look at this every two years? You know, what's your, what's your process for, for doing this? When we're going to make a change to curriculum, how do we do that? Where does it fit? And so there's a methodology for doing that. I typically don't like to have on my own PowerPoint slides lots of information like this. But this today I decided to do this because I wanted to kind of have this up on the screen for you just to see the breadth of a simple methodology around curriculum development. And I wanted you to see, you know, what are the elements for each of those, those areas of the process? You know, what's the, the goal of the process? And then again, what are those steps? What are those elements of the things that you need to do in order to, to do that well? Makes sense. So what we're going to do today is we can't do all of this. <laughs> that would be, you know, this is a, a, you know, this is a course that people take over, you know, you, you can actually get a PhD in this, in this methodology. Um, but today we're just going to touch on a couple of them. I've, I've highlighted them in green. And just so you can kind of, as we go through each one, you can say, huh, is that something that we've even thought about? And, and if so, how do we do in that area? So the first thing I wanted to do was really hit on that learning objectives. And, and do you have them? How do you have them? Have you defined them for each of those curriculums? More importantly, I'm, I'm curious, are they visible? Where do people see them? Where do patients see them? Do people get a, a syllabus? Do they get a, a, a workbook that has a clear, you know, uh, articulation of, of what are each of the modules and what are the things that we want you to learn in each of them. Do you give that to people at the beginning of each session when it is a psychoeducation session? Do you have a one pager that you hand out to people to say, here's what we're hoping you're going to learn today. Here's what we're going to go over and here's the, here's the learning objectives. Do your counselors, are they clear on what those objectives are before they go into group? You know, and so that everybody is marching to the same objectives. And so that's what we're going to talk about here just briefly. And what we thought we would share today again is the, this is learning 101, right? What are the basics of defining learning objectives? And so what I was hoping to share today was what you see on the screen, which is there are six different types of, of, of objectives. And I'm using just the, the basic, you know, example of stages of change just because that may be one that many of you are, are familiar with. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a critical concept and theory in the field, evidence-based practice. Many programs are structured around it. Uh, historically, it's been a model that 
that clinicians have used to help guide people through recovery, through the, the substance use disorder process, uh, into recovery, and, 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 and using from a clinical perspective. But what's happened over time is, is obviously like anything um, in, in learning is, why can't we make that a pet patient-centered tool and not it just be a clinical-centered tool? And so what we find now, as many of you find out, is we teach that. We now teach it. We just don't have that, you know, in the patient's file, you know, around our assessment of where we think they are, although that it's in there most of the time. But it's, we're allowing the, the, the patient, the individual, to really learn that concept, learn that framework, learn that model, so that, uh, uh, as you know, many things happen. A, I kind of learn that, oh, there's a model out there around this thing called change that I'm in and I need to be in. And in order to be successful, I'm going to have to move from whatever stage I am today into that maintenance stage. And so introducing that whole idea has become a patient-centered tool now, not just a clinical-centered tool. And that's one of the ones that, you know, question, do you, do you, you know, is that a topic in your curriculum? Is it in all of your programs? But in any event, to illustrate the idea of, of learning objectives, what are you trying to do with that, that model? go back to here is are you just trying to have people you know gain that knowledge right so can they you can see it very simple hey one one level of, of, of objectives is hey we want everybody in our program to be able to know what the five stages of change are we want them to know that you know it's pre-contemplation contemplation you know preparation action and move into maintenance right and so that's a model and and that is could be one of our learning objectives that hey, by the end of our program, by the end of our IOP, by the end of our residential program, people can name those five things. And we can measure that. We can actually test for that. And we can have a quiz, we can have a test, we can have a, an exit survey test, however you do that now, but that's, that's one level of, of, a, of, of understanding what the learning objectives that we're trying to obtain as the program. And you can see how that plays out when you go through these six levels. So the next level is, is, can people explain the five shades of change? Can they do that to others? Can, do you have an opportunity for people to practice that in your psychoeducation? Do you allow you know, some of your patients and clients to actually you know, let them explain it to new people that are joining the groups? See if they can. And, and, and that's another level of saying, hey, part of our learning objectives is not that people can just name it, but they, they can explain it to new people coming into the group. And in fact, I, as the counselor, I'm not gonna do that. Every time somebody new comes into the group, I'm gonna have somebody else explain that topic concept so that again, we can, we can get that learning you know, deeper into their system, right? Application, you can see that, hey, being able to do that in, in both process group or in, in a psychoeducation group, obviously that's one of the things we're hoping to do is not just lecture at it, right? Not stand in front of the room and say, hey, here's the stage of change and go through the, the PowerPoint slides or talk about it, right? But let's have people actually do something with it. And so how can they apply it to their own experience? And you can go through, I won't go through each of these, but I think this is an interesting model to say, you know, what level of learning are you trying to accomplish in your settings, right? And can you get down to that level of, you know, having people definitely create an action plan, being able to share that with another person, teach that to another person. And then at the end of the day, you know, one of the outcomes hopefully that we're trying to reach is that people will leave, you know, our treatment centers and move on into recovery with understanding how that model can benefit them. Understanding that, you know, how do I get to maintenance if I'm not there? Where, where, where am I at? How's that gonna benefit me? Why do I even wanna be in this process? And so again, that's just an example of that. So I'm just gonna stop for a second and just, I think I just ask an open-ended question to each of you, which is as you think about some of the psychoeducation programs in your program, some of those, I don't know what to call them. It's all over the map for me. I, I've been thinking about my language for today. Do I call those classes? Do I call those sessions? Do I call those groups, psychoeducation groups? You know, what do you call those, those modules in your, in your setting? And, and so that, you know, as you think about each of those, and sometimes it's something that might be sequential. It might be three or four things that, 
it's actually the learning is we're gonna we're gonna do four separate smaller modules around relapse that 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 really are around our relapse subject matter and so you know what's the learning objectives for the for the for the big four you know for the four pro you know four sessions and then in each of those sessions what's the learning objective and so you know i i challenge each of you to to as you go back to your programs go look at your materials go look at your curriculum go see where are those defined where are they written who gets to see them does the patient client get to see them do the counselor see them are they consistent in in our our location are they consistent in our multi locations you know how does that play out in terms of a curriculum map it's an interesting question i i I've, i found that this was a struggle in most of the organizations we ever worked with <laughs> this was just a struggle you know it's just a struggle to keep that consistency you know uh, when especially when it's you know over multiple locations and and when you have multiple people teaching that's where it also gets um a, a little bit more cloudy because you don't want to obviously we all know this we don't want to um what's the word, circumvent the creativity and the expertise and the competence of our counselors that are in our programs. We've hired them because they're good people. They're good at what they do. They know the subject matter. They're passionate about the work. But, you know, you allow each person to come in and teach the, those sessions, right? Over time, if you don't have that really clearly defined, then everybody starts to do it a little differently. And then somebody says, you know, I'm going to pull in this worksheet. I'm going to do it this way. And I'm going to bring in this model versus that model. And I'm going to have it look like this versus like that. And you multiply that times two counselors, times six counselors, times 50 counselors, times, you know, five programs. All of a sudden, what happens, and this happens to everybody, is you're once again totally inconsistent. And there's no, you know, there's no standardization across the program. And therefore, how can we, you know, measure any learning, measure any outcomes if we, if we don't have some sort of standardization? Boy, I've harped on that one. Wow. So hopefully I didn't uh, put anybody to sleep. But uh, again, these are questions that I, I'm hoping you'll, you'll, you'll think about and explore back in your own programs. So back to the ADDI process model. You know, the other part we're, we're going to just touch on is in, instructional strategies. And again, there, there's a whole, this is a whole, you know, half day session. And I think what we just want to talk about today is, of course, that, hey, there's this thing called how do we design the learning? And what is our instructional strategies for, given the learning that we're trying to, to, to have happen with our patients, whatever that topic is. You know, what is that subject matter that we want to teach them? What's the objectives that we want them to achieve? At what level do we want to achieve them? And then, you know, if we look at the basics. How many people are going to be in the audience? How many people in that room are our, 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 our psychoeducation groups? You know, we keep our process groups at six or, or 10, no more than 12, but we let the psychoeducation groups go to 20. You know, how do we do that? What's our model for how we do that in our organization? And then again, you can see some of the pieces. Well, we have the design learning around that. You know, are we going to pay instructors to come in? Are we going to have our existing counselor base do that? Are they good facilitators? What's their skill at facilitating action learning? What kind of media are we going to use? Are people even, you know, do they know how to use certain kinds of media? And so based on, you know, again, it all comes from what are we going to teach people? What do we want them to learn? What's the objectives? Then how do we, you know, put the, put the model together so that we, we select the right strategy. And those strategies, there's so many, there's thousands of strategies, but that's again where, you know, you know where, where, where do you want to do it? What have you done? What's been successful? And so there's a process for doing that. And, you know, again, in a broader context, you know, people have to think about what is the best methods? You know, is it online that we have people do something in a mobile learning format? You know, is it face-to-face -face classroom? Is it a combination? You know, I know that, that you all are coming from the treatment centers and from the you know, recovery organizations and programs. But, you know, I, I throw this out to you. You know, what, what, what's happening today may not happen in three years from now. And there may be, you know, a, a, a way 
that people will be able to do more blended learning, especially in your IOP programs, where you may have people that are joining online, that you may have people that are able to do some homework assignment online prior to coming. You know, so how do you structure that? How do you really structure that learning? It's, it's uh, you know, we had a program, and I don't have to, to go into a whole nother uh, kind of area, but we had a program one time where we were working with a large financial institution and they said to us, you know, one of the things that we want to have people do, and this was a basic outcome was, and they had, it had a counseling uh, component to it, is that we want everybody in this, this high potential group to have a career goals and a learning plan that they are invested in personally. And that's going to be good for them and good for the organization. And they say, we have eight hours to do that. What's the best approach for us doing at the end of the day? So at the end of eight hours, you know, this is different than your settings. How would you accomplish that? And based on all of the, the resources we had for that program, what we ended up doing was we ended up having a one hour orientation webinar where each of these groups came in, there were, there were 25 people in a group, and we invited them to a one hour orientation session, say, hey, here's, the, here's what we're gonna do in this program, this eight hour program, and here's the learning objectives, here's the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, here's the things we want you to do, and here's what's gonna happen. And then what happened was they went into a, <clears throat> another step, which was they got to do some online assessments. And they took some assessments and that was part of the learning. There was a time of, you know, an hour and there was an hour dedicated for mobile, you know, individual self-directed learning. And they came back to another webinar where they learned uh, another a methodology on how to, get, to look at career planning and goal setting. And then we assigned them to a career coach. They went and then had a, a session with a career coach for an hour or two. And then they came back, they did, the, they did the, the, the planning for their career goals. They came back to the career coaches again, they met with their managers, they came back to the career coach again, and at the end of the day, the goal was that they had learning goals that they were invested in, that were good for the organization, good for their manager, and, and where they were headed. And so, you know, you can see, wow, boy, that's a lot of methodologies and you know, a lot of different ways to do that learning. And, and so who knows where this field is going to go, you know, five years from now. And so uh, just, again, how are you putting the learning together today? Where is it going? And uh, <clears throat> what, I, what we do know, right, today, let's come back to today. What we do know today is, is that, you know, most of it's in the classroom, that we have people at a treatment center and we're having face-to-face. -face, they're coming in for an IOP. There's HIPAA rules in place that, that make that a uh, necessity. And so we're, we're doing that. And so when we're in that setting, how do we, how do we do that the best way we can? Questions for you here around the, the, the curriculum. You know, a question for you to, to, to explore is, you know, how, how competent are your, your counselors at facilitating group learning, action learning kinds of, of, of settings? I was with a, a large organization more recently, and the person said to me, you know, we, we had this, <clears throat> this one module that we do, and we have seven counselors here, and the only person that teaches that is Sue, because everybody else is uncomfortable doing that in a group setting, of actually taking them through that module, you know, walking them through it, making sure they're going to get some learning in it, they're going to make it, uh, act, you know, make it uh, much more facilitated, give people pro questions to process as groups, and, and so, wow, I was thinking, wow, you know, how does that happen that the skill and level of some of our counselors, um, you know, to facilitate some of those groups, you know, is, is there's a gap. And so how do we help them? Do we, do we ever, you know, bring in facilitation skill training for our counselors so that they can be more competent in that other setting uh, around that, that, that other psychoeducation piece? So again, these are some of the questions you can see them on the screen. And uh, how do you do that? So. One of the things I do want to touch on here, and again, it's just the, some of the basics of the structure sometimes of that classroom setting. And again, this is, uh, you guys are more familiar with this because you've been in that, that, that setting that has both the process group and the psychoeducation component to it. Well, you know, from a structural, just how you set up a room, you know, a question for you is as you, as you walk down your hallways and you have people going into a group today, you know, you see, you know, all the groups getting started, you know, 
is it a process group or is it a psychoeducation group? You know, can you, do you know what it is? Your counselors, when they're walking in, are they clear what kind of group it is? Is it, is it going to be, is the room set up for it? And, you know, in a perfect world for good action learning in a classroom, you see it on the right. You know, it's set up in a way where you can make it, you know, project based. That you have, you know, your leader in blue there um, and they're, you know, in the middle facilitating. You know, the room is, is typically structured that, you know, maybe there is a, 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 a a screen or a you know a way to put a PowerPoint presentation up on the screens. You know, do you have flip charts around the room so that you can, you know, bring out key concepts? You can assign groups to a flip chart so that they can do a, a part of the 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 the, uh, the assignment. Do it in a way where they are also posting those key learnings. You know, and then you know when they're reporting out to the bigger group. You know, they, they're the, the room's set up for all that. It's set up for the maximization of sharing time for those individuals. You know, one of the things that you, you all, you know, intuitively seen over the, probably your whole experience in, the, in, in, this, in this area is, you know, in a process group, you know, it's uh, one person's talking at a time. And so the, obviously that's there for a reason, it's a therapeutic setting and, and that's, you know, that's, that, that is the best uh, uh, evidence-based approach for that kind of a setting. But in a psychoeducation group, one of the, 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 the objectives is to maximize sharing time. The more you can have people pair up, the more you can have table work going on, the more you can, it, it just maximizes the ability for that individual to actually speak in a room and, and be able to process what they're learning and do it in an active way. So whereas in a process group, you know, do the math, you have, you know, 60 minutes and you know, say you had, you know, 10 people, each person has six minutes. In a psychoeducation group, there is a way to have it so that people are talking or working or working, interacting and participating with others in the group, you know, 30 to 40 minutes of that, of that time. And so that again is how you structure the, the learning. And so that is, again, a question I throw out to each of you is, you know, do you have the, you know, the physical resources to be able to host good psychoeducation groups? Do you leverage those as much as you can? You know, do you actually, you know, it takes, a, you know, one of the things we all know, and I mean, I certainly know this in my own experience is it takes more time to prepare a really good learning setting. I mean, you got to be really rigorous around, okay, what's the learning objectives? You know, what are we going to do? What's the, what, are, what, what are the models we're going to present? What's the activity for the tables? What's the questions that the pairs are going are to work on together? What's the report out structure uh, as we do that? How do I manage that well? Uh, and so, you know, it, 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 it's, hard, it's hard work sometimes to do that. Um, and that's where I think there's an opportunity to, to, help, to help our folks do that. Um, back to the ADDI process. A little bit more. So again, we're, we've been in the design piece. Um, we're going to stay in design one more moment, and we're going to just talk about measurement, and I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. But, you know, this is a question for each of you is, you know, what do you do to really measure that psychoeducation part of the learning? You know, what are the elements that you, you could be measuring uh, if you really wanted to try to differentiate yourself from your from, from your, your competitors. And so, and then are you measuring? And again, this is, you know, this is, takes work. Um, I, I think the benefits longer term could be immense in terms of really seeing how it impacts outcomes. Um, and, but it's hard work to actually get this structured. And so, you know, there's seven types of learning metrics according into, uh, as you dive, dive deeper into the ADDI process. And here they are. And that's not, a, uh, that's not an acronym there with cell cap. And it's not cell pop if you bring in the problem solving or the outcomes over to the left. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just the way they stacked up. Satis you know, measuring satisfaction, measuring engagement, measure learning comprehension, and you see the list. And so a question right out of the gate for you 
is what are you measuring uh, for people in your programs? Again, heart, you know, you really have to be thoughtful about how you take this on and, and what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So let's just dive into each one very quickly. You know, satisfaction, it's the basic, it's a level one. You know, did the learner find the session information? I mean, sometimes you see this when you go to conferences, right? You know, the, the basic, uh, uh, the basic feedback form is, you know, was it enjoyable? Was the presenter, you know, how was the presenter? Were they prepared? Were they confident? Were they organized? And then there's always one around course materials. Hey, was it professional? You know, and again, so this is just the, the basics of satisfaction, you know, um, which is a very, you know, if you really, really think about it, uh, you know, how important is this? in terms of the real objective and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, right? The yeah. next one, which is one where I really think there's a wonderful opportunity here in this setting is, you know, is, is just uh, raising the awareness around just engagement. And this is where, you know, it's, uh, you've all been in groups, you've all seen groups, you know, you got people dominating those, those settings, you got people not playing, they're not participating. People are pulling crap out of the air because they have to say something. And so, you know, this becomes a, 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 another one around, you know, just some of the basics around engagement. Did they complete the assignments? What was the quality of the assignments they completed? If they were in a residential program, did they do that assignment? And they, did they do that lifeline? Did they do that, you know, whatever the assignment was and bring it to the, to the, to the class and present it? And, and, and what level of quality was that? You know, were they present? I mean, were they present physically and mentally in the group? You know, I know we noticed that. I know we processed that. But, you know, do you have a way to measure that? You know, how many people were present in each setting? How were they, you know, blah, 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 blah. Harder one to do. Um, did they participate fully? You know, what level did they interact? Did they interact? Did they share? What was the quality of this year? Was it meaningful? Was it not meaningful? I know there's a couple of organizations that do this really well. And think about this, you know. Um, you know, I know an organization that is in Annapolis, Maryland. I won't name it. But when they do learning settings and they do, one of the things that the facilitator, they have a second facilitator in the room and they do what they call a participation map. If you can imagine, what's a participation map? It actually is a map of each individual in that learning setting, and it actually maps the conversation that, you know, this person said something, they shared, this person shared next, here's about the length of time that they shared, what's, what was the quality of that share, then who shared next, it's almost like a diagram with, with, uh, with uh, you know, um, uh, lines going back and forth, kind of mapping what was the participation structure of that group? Wow, think about that. I'm not advocating for that. I'm not saying that that's something you should do. I'm just saying, huh, right? They're really looking at participation at another level. And they, and they, they and, and their methodology thinks that, that it, I mean, it's critical to the outcomes that they're trying to achieve, right? Learning comprehension, did they understand the information presented back to those learning objectives? You know, what was the major insight takeaway? Can they apply it? You know, again, what level of those learning objectives are you trying to get on the comprehension side? You know, do you want them to be able to explain it? Do you want them to be able to put an action plan around it? What are you doing around learning comprehension? What are you doing around learning retention? You know, do you remember, do they remember what you taught them? You know, how long? Do you measure it? Do you test for it? Can they name, you know, those different mindfulness practices? Can they, can they tell you the four levels of, or four, you know, levels of valiance uh, defense mechanisms model? Can they, tell you about the, 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 if you're using the phases of addiction disease model, the gel neck curve, can they talk about the process and, and can they explain that? You know, where are they able to teach it to others? You know, what's the retention of that? How long does it last? You know, can you come back to them midway in treatment, at the end of treatment? Can you go at them later in time and when you're doing some stuff, ask them a question around uh, some of that subject matter and see if they still remember it. Critical thinking, right? Are we measuring this? Are they able to apply it? Can they put it, you know, as, as you build treatment plans, you know, are they able to put it into practice? Do you actually have a, a way in that session to practice the behaviors? And I'm sure many of you do do that. There's a way to do some role plays. But again, are we getting down to the problem solving? Are we allowing that uh, and designing the setting in order to do that, right? 
instead of it being just a lecture. It's one of the things I, I don't like about webinars, right? So here I am doing a webinar and all I'm doing is talking. Boy, I gotta tell you, this is not my style. You know, I would much rather be in a room with each of you saying, hey, let's look at, you know, one of our modules and let's do some of this and let's practice it and let's see how we would design it and, and make it much more of an active learning, a much more of a conversation. You know, so again, critical thinking and problem solving, are you getting to that level? Are you measuring it, right? Achievement, this really kind of maps into, you know, back into the outcomes. So how does the, the psychoeducation learning component of what you're doing in your programs, how does that relate to the overall outcomes that you're trying to achieve? You know, and so uh, that again is something, can you, can you, you know, do you measure that? Can you tie it back to, you know, those learning objectives that they did in the setting, you know? Did they stop using, you know, because they, you know, they remembered a process that they could, they could jump back into based on the learning that they got from your program. You know, all these things, it's, it's hard to measure at this level, but obviously we could make some, some connections. And that, that is one of the things that, that R1 is going to be on the hunt for. One of our goals is going to be to really try to tie the learning curriculum part of the programs to the outcomes and that people, we believe, just a basic premise that programs that have a very structured, well-organized curriculum that is consistent across their programs and their locations, and, and they can do that very well, they will be able to make better, you know, um, uh, so they'll be able to tie uh, the, the outcomes of their overall programs and the learning component of that will be a piece of that of that outcome process. Um, I go deep more deeply into how that happens and, and what, what that rationale looks like. Can't do it here today, but I think it's going to be an important part of this equation, you know, in the long term. People that do that well will definitely differentiate themselves from the program. And lastly, you know, again on this last piece, and then we're gonna we're gonna really move quickly at the, the end piece here is, you know, the program retention. You know, are people staying? Are they staying longer? Are they extending care? Do they complete the follow-up surveys? You know, what's your program retention? And for some people that, you know, are doing outpatient programs that want to retain those clients, you know, if they're not engaged in that learning setting, trust me, they're going to turn off and that's part of their own, you know, their own equation. And so how do you engage them earlier? How do you engage them in their own learning? How do you make it a self-discovery process versus a lecture? How do you make sure that in a psychoeducation setting, you don't allow people to dominate the, the setting, that you structure it as action learning so that everybody's gonna get to share, everybody's gonna get to participate and therefore must be much more engaged in their own recovery in that learning process. Okay. Last thing we're gonna to jump to uh, here at the very end is just a little bit on learning theory. We've got about five minutes left here, but I do wanna to touch on this because it is critical in terms of how you design your psychoeducation. You know, are you really paying attention to the, the people in the rooms, you know, and thinking through, are we doing things that address all of those different learning styles? And so here's a basic model. Many of you may know this, may have seen it, there's different kinds of frameworks around learning styles. This is the one that we've landed on. Most of the time, as you, you hear that it's visual, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, we like to break away the verbal and the, and, the, and the logical piece. And so again, so I mean, this is just a basic model. You can see, you can think about your own experience and your own learning. A question for you is what's your learning style or styles, right? Where do you feel like you're most engaged in your own learning? And certainly, you know, if you really sat down and there's learning tests on this, there's tests that you can take to, to figure that out. But again, what we want to talk just briefly here today is, are you designing that learning in that psychoeducation setting to address all of these learning styles, right? You know, again, is it just a lecture or are we doing things where people can do something kinesthetic, do something that's problem solving, get the auditory and the visual stimuli going and so you really maximize that. We're just gonna to touch on two. Uh, we're gonna talk on visual and we're gonna talk a little bit about kinesthetic. So again, you know, some of the basics here around visual learning styles is, you know, people learn by seeing, you can see the things on the screen here. Um, 
but again, you know, do, are you, you know, the, the, where we're getting to on this, on this thing is what are you doing in your own programs to, to address that learning style? Do you have good graphic organizers and models as part of your curriculum? Are you using photos and pictures? Are you using charts and graphs? Are you using flip charts effectively? You know, are you using, you know, tools that really pull those visual learners into that setting, right? So again, that would be a nice, you know, one of the things that we have here at R1 is we actually have a way to assess curriculum. And one of the things that we like to assess is the visual styles or excuse me, the learning styles of the, you know, of your curriculum. And so that's something that I would also challenge you to go back and say, okay, let's look at some of our modules and what are we doing? You know, some of the basics there, again, we can't go into detail, but you know, stages of change. I'm just going to use that as an example because that crosses lots of programs, but what is your, you know, what's your model for it? What's your visual model about when you present that to patients and clients? Is it busy? Is it simple? Is it crisp? Is it consistent when I go into this room with this counselor or I go into that room with another counselor or if I go to another location, are we actually using the same visual model? You know, those are where standardization and questions come in. And so which ones are you using? Whatever you're doing, do you have a model that you've chosen across your organization to talk about relapse triggers or whatever it is? Is it standard? What have you chosen? Is it busy? Is it catching the learner's eye? Is it something that's memorable for them? You know, I don't know the answer for your organization. This will be a question for you is what's our visual learning strategy around how we're presenting the information? Another one is of the five, we're just going to touch on physical, the kinesthetic piece. Again, you know, this is where, you know, are you hitting those, you know, those basically the people that like to do, they learn by doing, they learn by real life, you know, problem solving, they learn by experiential learning. And do you have ways to do that? Are you getting people just to move around, stand up, move around, pair up with other people? You know, are they doing something where they can move their hands or cards or, you know, anything that gets them out of, you know, uh, you know, a lecture setting where they're, you know, that they're actually being able to do something. And so again, this is a little checklist. Hey, let's go back to some of our modules. And are we, are we doing some of these things? How do we do them? Are they effective? Okay, we're just running, we're running out of time here. You know, again, it's a, there's a, there's a big process here and there's a bunch of pieces. Hopefully you're getting something out of this, this webinar today around just, I mean, I guess what I'm hoping you're, you're going to get out is, is just questions for yourself. A little bit of a framework. Obviously we all need a framework, a best practice, but then again, in it, you know, what are those things when I go back to our setting and I go walk down that hall, right? And I'm walking by, you know, my counselor that's going to be going in, or maybe I am the counselor going in that room. You know, one of the things I'm hoping, even in the simplest form of walking away from today's session, you'll say, you know, you might be able to ask the question, hey, is that a, is that a process group you're going into today or a psychoeducation group? You know, and if it is a psychoeducation group, you say, so what are you doing? You know, what's the activities? What are you actually, what's the structure of it? You know, how's the room set up? You can actually physically go in and see how they're setting it up, you know, and ask the question, you know, I'm curious, you know, what are the objectives for the, for the learning today? What are you, what are you hoping if people are going to, oh, actually, I'm going to change that word, not hoping. What are you planning for your learners to walk away with when they leave this hour setting today? What's the one or two things that you'd like to measure in it? that we could test them on at the next time they come in or at the very end of the class. Let's just do a quick quiz. Have you designed a quick three question quiz, quiz or a five question quiz just to test and see if the learner learned what you were trying to teach them today. So again, some basics around that. I'm gonna close down here. Again, I, I'd love to spend, my, thank you for all you know being on the call today. I'm gonna stop here for a moment. I know we were really at the end of the time but any questions for me? Um, um, again, I see most, I saw nine people when we started and I see, ten, I see nine people here at the end. Um, you know, I, I, this is a big conversation. I've taken on curriculum development, enhancing what you're doing, what's the process, 
how can we do that? You know, how can we up our game? Yeah, I guess that's the question I'm hoping that you'll ask is, how can we up our game where we are so that when people leave our program that we're clear on what we wanted to have them learn and how, how does that connect to their recovery process so that they can take that learning and apply it? It's like any other subject matter. You know, this is a taxonomy. This is a vocabulary. This is a theory. There's a lot of theories in this process. And, you know, our patients and our clients, you know, um, want to learn that. So thank you for coming. I want to just reiterate, we have a poll here at the end um, that we want you to take and, and give us feedback. Um, and I think with that, so again, thank you for, for coming today. Thank you for for uh, being present and thank you for all the work you do in recovery and in your programs and helping people on this path. It's, uh, it's good work, it's service work and I thank you for it. Have a good day.